thank you everybody for joining us. I know it's a crazy day because we've got a provost candidate on campus and gosh darn them, you know, we scheduled this first and then they scheduled and what, what can you do? But that's okay, because ours will be much more exciting, I can guarantee that. Uh, so we, we have Megan Gibbons here and thanks to Heidi and, and Amy um, who were talking about Megan and uh, about how wonderful she is and she's been all over the the state and maybe the country I don't know training the world the world, the world. The world. yes yeah. <laughs> oh hi yeah see coming out of the woodwork I told you we're gonna be more exciting uh, tra training people with this this coil method I, I I don't know anything about it so I'm very excited to learn about this um, Megan's a Fulbright scholar and she's at Glenville State College and this is a multicultural learning environment. It links colleges and uh, universities from different countries. So students can get this international experience without even um, leaving home. So it sounds really neat. And she's going to show us what this is like. And we'll get our feet wet and we get a little training. I know we don't have a ton of time, but um, I'm sure we can reach out for you, to you yes, and, and get more help. And so we're just excited to have you here. Thanks for making the trip. And sorry we're short. I'm sure tomorrow we'll have a lot more people because um, we won't cross with the, the big interview process going on on campus. But, well, okay, thank you. Then. Don't worry. Um, All right. it's, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. Thank you. Uh, I know you're busy. I'm, I'm still faculty too, so I understand that carving out time like this is difficult. I appreciate that you're here to listen to me today. Uh, some of you maybe have heard a little bit about COIL uh, because of the work that Amy and Heidi have been involved in on campus, but some of you maybe are coming to this for the very first time. So I've tried to kind of get, create a presentation today that provides an overview, but then sort of hones in on a specific example, one of my own coils, and then moves out into sort of, you know, generally, where can we go from here at the end of the, the presentation. Uh, but we are a small group, so I'd encourage you to stop at any point, ask, ask questions, interrupt, um, and, you know, hope that we, this can be as productive as possible for you. So, um, teaching beyond the walls, connecting classrooms via a virtual exchange. And before we dive into virtual exchange and the COIL method in particular, I always like to remind everyone in the room about where study abroad, traditional exchange, right? Where it is right now, and sort of trends in study abroad. And so I like to use this graphic, right, of the education abroad numbers nationally. And a few years ago, three years ago I think it was, over 300,000 U.S. students did participate in study abroad. We finally crept over the 300,000 mark. In, in international education, that was a really big milestone. The reality, however, is that in terms of percentage of U.S. undergraduates studying, it's uh, less than 10%. Okay. In fact, it's, a, it's around 2%, right, are those national numbers. So, 1 in 10 U.S. undergraduates does have the opportunity to study abroad, right? And that means then we have nine other students here, right, who don't. So, how can we reach them, right? How can we reach that 90% who cannot or will not have that opportunity? And that's where virtual exchange is coming into play. So virtual exchange, uh, this is a sort of definition that I pulled from the Virtual Exchange Coalition, okay? And it talks about technology-enabled, sustained, people-to-people -people education programs, okay? And virtual exchange teach participants 21st century skills that prepare them to more effectively deal with difference and to collaborate and communicate across cultures thereby enhancing global peace and prosperity. Okay. So virtual exchange is gaining momentum on the national scene. And there have been several conferences recently, um, roundtable discussions in DC. I've been able to participate in some of those. And there are a lot of really interesting initiatives happening in the virtual exchange field. 
Um, the Stevens Initiative is the one that comes to mind. They've worked specifically with COIL and other models of virtual exchange, and they're backed by the Bezos Foundation. So there are, are companies who are really interested in putting their money right towards this endeavor. And you know, the, the, the real question moving forward is how can we sort of leverage the work that's been done in this field to expand, right, scale up these efforts and reach more students. The organizations at, uh, that are sort of members of this virtual exchange coalition are SOLIA, which maybe you've heard of. Oh, that got, it's Iron USA that got cut off there. And, um, and another group called Global, Global Nomads, right? The Global Nomads group. So Global Nomads and Iron USA, here they are, they're all here a little bit slow, are working primarily in secondary. So Leah is working in secondary and higher ed, and COIL is, is located largely right now just in higher ed, okay? So there are different options out there, and I'm not suggesting that you have to use the COIL method as the only method, right, of virtual exchange. Um, but, uh, so Leah is different, okay? And we can talk about that after. If you're interested in, well, how is Solia different from COIL, then just ask me at the end. If we have time, I'll, I'll tell you what some of those differences are. But for today's purpose, we are gonna focus on COIL and what is that? Collaborative Online International Learning. Now, the acronym is problematic in some ways because of the use of online. Mm -hmm. right? And I think a lot of people look at this, hear this, and in this, well, it's an online class, and it isn't. This is not the same as an online class. You're using online technology to deliver right, this learning experience, but it isn't necessarily the same as an online class. So there's some, there's some problems with the acronym, and, um, and for that reason, you hear about globally networked teaching, globally networked classrooms, globally connected right, classrooms. Um, and the, the COIL method has come to us largely from the state of New York. And I do mention um, New York and SUNY COIL because they have a really well-developed network. They have a training system in place. And they've been working deliberately at the state level for about 10 years in this field. And they do have an annual conference. And it's usually in March or April every year in New York. And I would highly recommend that conference for anybody who is looking for some more, maybe even networking with international partner possibilities, or just going to a great variety of sessions on how different people are putting this into practice. So what is collaborative online international learning? Um, combines the four essential dimensions of real virtual mobility. It's collaborative, right, and not just with students, it's also the instructors, professors involved. Uh, it makes use of online technology, and it has potential international dimensions, and it's also, this is also very important, it's integrated into the learning process, right? This isn't just something that's sort of dropped in and off to the side and you do as an extra credit project, okay? Um, but I do like to kind of run through, I'll put these up first. Um, what is COIL, what is it not, right? And it's not a substitute for traditional study abroad. I think, I see these as very complementary, right, strategies, but it's not a substitute. It's not a MOOC, right, which is a sort of open resource for, for everybody and yet an access to everybody. It's not a curriculum in and of itself. In Europe, the big trend was, uh, for maybe the last 20 years, this idea of teleconferencing. And that was an avenue that they were exploring in Europe for a long time, and still are. But it isn't just that. <coughs> nor is it just a technology platform, nor is it software. Okay. So then the question really is, all right, well, let's focus on what is it. Collaborative teaching using online communication that involves two or more cultures. So. We have partners at Glenville right now in Mexico, in Spain, in Malaysia. There's, and we work, and my students, for instance, work just with students in Spain. But there are some coils that are developed at East Carolina University, for instance, where you have 
um, two or three different cultures in addition to the U.S. group, right? So they, they're working with students from, let's say, France, students from Germany and Mexico, <coughs> all in one, okay? Um, but at least two, and it can be more than two. The collaborative piece is very important here. So the success of one group depends on the participation and the interaction of the other group, okay? They have to be made dependent upon each other, right? If it's simply recording a classroom presentation and putting it up there and then having the others watch and comment, that's great. It's, an, it's a good exchange. It's not that that isn't invalu it's valuable in and of itself. However, that's not truly collaborative. Right. So how do we get them to design those presentations together and then put them up there, right, would be the next step. It's customized to fit the mission, culture, and learning objectives of each institution. So here's where it gets tricky. Because it's customized, faculty tend to really like it because you can put your own stamp on your COIL work, right? But there's no cookie cutter formula that works for all of these, right? It's tied to your course's learning objectives, and it's tied to your partner's learning objectives. So you have to find the learning objectives that you have in common, or maybe create one or two new ones that you can share, and then you design your activities from those learning objectives. Right? So you start with the SLOs, and you move out. Which means that Heidi's coil, and Amy's coil, and my coil, while we might do some things that are similar, they're going to be drastically different because our learning objectives are all different. Yeah. And then it is important too that this is applicable to all disciplines. Right. A lot of people think initially of languages, and I am a Spanish professor. Language is near and dear to my heart, and literature is too. Um, and a lot of good work has happened in this area. This kind of work has happened in language classrooms for years before it was called COIL. Okay. Uh, but we're seeing a real interest in increase in COILs in other areas. So we actually have an environmental science COIL at Glenville State. We have, there are music COILs out there. Thank you. Um, business, computer science, you name it, they're all getting involved. And the other piece about this is it doesn't necessarily have to be a English to English, psychology to psychology, history to history match. It actually discourage that and look for interdisciplinary uh, collaborations like psychology and business or uh, history and linguistics, right? And um, those are the ones that actually yield the most interesting results most of the time. Okay. So <clears throat> who is doing this? Obviously New York, obviously SUNY. That's their Coil, SUNY.edu is their website, and I do recommend that you start there. It's a good resource. There's a lot of their case studies. They have um, other resources available. A faculty guide for Coil course development. You can get on their list serve and get information about the conference and other things happening in their Coil world. But over on the other side of the country, uh, the University of Washington system has been establishing its own sort of hub in that region of the U.S. and uh, Bothell in particular and is doing a lot of work so we've, we've got this sort of uh, Pacific Northwest hub that's emerged and uh, the other actually I, I'm not gonna I'll just mention it um, there's a great article that's part of the Bothell web page uh, classrooms Without Borders, one of their professors there who's Peruvian um, and the COIL that she's developed with students in Peru and, and her students at, at Basel. So there's um, a nice piece there on what they're doing. But the other, the other hub that I see emerging is one closer to home, okay, um, with the HEPC. And the HEPC is really interested has made uh, COIL a sort of pillar of its inter internationalization plan for the state. Uh, so we, we are seeing COILs develop here, obviously already at Glenville, West Liberty, and we'd like to see more of those member institutions right, um, start to develop their own pilots. 
I personally have traveled to Ohio, Pennsylvania, some other parts of sort of Appalachia, and doing faculty outreach training with uh, you know, faculty and staff at those institutions who are also interested in, in moving in this direction. So there's this new hub emerging in our area. So why should we be doing this? Probably here I'm not preaching to a choir, but in some rooms I am, okay? Um, I'll come back to this in a second, but our students don't have the intercultural skills they need to be successful when they graduate. You know, that's where I've been doing some research, some of the Fulbright research that I was working on. It's looking at the de development of these intercultural skills in the, the virtual exchange work, and they don't have them. Okay, so we need to help them develop those. The interdisciplinary nature of this right, is also highly attractive because a lot of institutions are looking for ways to sort of break down silos right, and, and have dialogues across campus. The internationalization of the curriculum. If your curriculum is in need of a slight overhaul, right, uh, if there are pockets where you don't have a lot of international work happening in a certain area on campus, this is a way to make that happen, right? And, and it can be very organic and not top driv top down driven, right? It can be very grassroots because the faculty will be uh, championing that. It's also, this is me, my own bias, but it's really rewarding for me as a professional, for me as a scholar. It's given me the opportunity, as we were sort of joking about before, to travel the world, to travel to Spain, to travel to Mexico, to travel to conferences here in the U.S., New York, Chicago, D.C., elsewhere, and um, in, in develop, in some cases, right, really strong professional relationships that sometimes, you know, turn into friendships, too, right? Um, so my network has grown. Uh, my research is, has taken a new direction that I wasn't necessarily planning on it taking, um, but uh, you know, those possibilities for faculty especially, you know, what do I gain out of putting in this extra work to make this happen? The chance to publish in a different place, to present in a different place perhaps, to get in involved in, you know, maybe research in a field that's sort of up and coming, right? All of those possibilities are there. So one of the tools, and I won't spend too much time on this, uh, but one of the tools that I'm using to assess those intercultural skills is called the Intercultural Effectiveness Scale. So this is a research instrument. It does cost some money, uh, but HUPC has, has been helpful in supporting right, um, the use of this tool to basically do needs, needs assessment. And it measures continuous learning, interpersonal engagement, and hardiness. Right? So for continuous learning, essentially, what knowledge do I have of another culture, and how interested am I in learning more? Okay. Also, how accurate is that knowledge? That's another key piece there. Mm -hmm. Interpersonal engagement, then. Am I, am I willing to learn another language to have a better relationship with people? On a people-to-people -people level, where do I fit? Do I withhold judgment? Do I judge immediately when I encounter something different? Right? And then the hardiness. As I'm negotiating these interactions with a culture that is unfamiliar to me, how do I respond emotionally? Do I shut down when I make a cultural faux pas or a language mistake, right? Or, or am I able to sort of bounce back and keep going? So it's trying to gauge how um, people function uh, emotionally in all of this. And these are the results from Glenville. You might imagine our students are, they're not quite your students, but they'll have a lot of similarities, a lot of first generation, low income students, um, rather homogenous student body as well. Um, and the, so the blue is Glenville and the orange is the, the group from Spain, so University of Oviedo in northern Spain. And this is the pretest data for the last two years, and you can see the low end of the intercultural scale, right, is this big giant blue block. So it's 55% of our students test at a one or two, and the top score is a seven. Okay. So when you come over to those top scores, um, that's seven percent. Okay. 
and then we have sort of a you know sizable chunk then in the middle. But when you compare that to our peers, what's interesting for me really is just, you know, obviously that's not too much of a surprise. They have a lot more students who are a little further along, in part because we're working with students who are studying English, that's their degree there at Oviedo, and many have participated in Erasmus. Okay, so there's sort of a, is a different profile. So this isn't necessarily surprising. What is surprising is this. They are studying English, they are traveling abroad, and yet only, um, it's less than 20%, it's about 18% have those high scores, right? So kind of across the board, right, there's this need. So what we'll do now is um, look at SLOs that I set up for my, one of my coils, and I'll sort of walk you through one of the coils in terms of how does this really work, right? What is it? Uh, student learning outcome or objective. Okay. Um, so the one that I've been focusing on most, most right, is this increasing of self-awareness by comparing and contrasting cultural beliefs, right? Um, the intercultural or interpersonal communication, right, is a is another coil that we've or SLO that we've established. So how might we assess some of these? Those are kind of really not um, very bright. I'm sorry about that. Um, there we go. It's just a little bit of a delay. I know, yeah, right? Yeah. All those spirits. So, uh, classroom assessment techniques, the 321, um, guided reflections, close reading, internal questionnaire, external survey. In, in one case, it's translation in small groups, editing those translations, joint Skype sessions, small group video conferences teaching presentations that are live, perhaps. So this is just a variety of activities that have kind of stemmed from, right, some of these learning objectives. <clears throat> and I know I'm moving quickly, but I'm trying to leave time for you to have uh, questions at the end. So my partner and I set up a, a sample, um, well, a, a sort of timeline for the exchange, right? And we always look to do this for about four to six weeks, usually six, right? That's my target number. So, you know, about six weeks of the semester where we map it out and we say, okay, this is, you know, these are our weeks, these are the activities, this is what we expect you, how much time we expect you maybe to dedicate to those activities, these are the resources you need, Moodle, Zoom, laptop, email, whatever it may be, and then are you doing this inside or outside of class? And you'll notice a lot of it is actually outside of class, right? We have time zone differences, and that's a factor, but it doesn't have to be a factor if, you know, the activity for that week is get into the forum, read what's happening there, write your own post, right? Um, and participate in that online discussion when you can, and that doesn't need to take up your class time necessarily, okay? But I do, during a COIL module, I do usually tend to set aside at least one class period for a synchronous session if there's a chance to do that. And I do tend to set aside 10 to 15 minutes of class time once a week to address anything that maybe is happening online in, the, in that coil space. Okay. Um, so you need to have a kind of structured approach that includes a chance for students to get to know one another and get comfortable with the technology, and then a chance for them to compare and contrast cultures, right, and sort of expand on their knowledge base, uh, and then moving towards some kind of, a lot of times it's a project-based, right, kind of a, a activity or some sort of um, collaborative, right, work that is a cumulative outcome, right, in terms of the, the last two to three weeks of the COIL. So this, this is a student cultural photo introduction. So what we've got, we've done two different things. Um, we asked them to introduce themselves in a forum by uploading a, a cultural photo, so not just a selfie, right, a selfie, you know, a picture of them that reflects something about their culture, or they can do this with a video, right, so we give them the choice. Most students still opt for the photo. So this was actually one of our my students in a in a literature class, introduction to Hispanic Hispanic literature, 
he wasn't from West Virginia, as he, as he stays here, I'm from Florida, and he talked about the Gulf Coast, and, um, and he sort of, you know, shared what life is like and culture is like in the Gulf Coast. And so for even his peers there in class in West Virginia, he said, I didn't know that. I didn't, when they read this, right, I didn't know this and this. And, you know, it, they learn about sometimes each other in the more, right, than they, than they realize in this process of sharing with students from, you know, another part of the world. Um, so, I pulled for you just a few of the other photos that tend to come out of this, and these are my most recent ones. Um, you know, sort of traditional Asturian and folklore dress, right? And um, then we have our, we had a lot of musicians in my fall group this past fall, so, you know, marching band, um, and I was just, you know, looking sharp and spiffy, but in the middle of the woods, right? And so it's really interesting how they choose, the students choose to sort of present themselves and their culture. And then the idea is, you know, they have to respond to at least three of the posts from the other group, okay? And that one is a whole group activity. My partner and I do commit to responding to every single one of the other students. So I respond to all the students from Spain and she responds to all of my students. We don't do that for the entire duration of the module, just that intro to sort of let you know everybody know we're all engaged, we're all interested, and we're all thankful that you're participating. Yeah. Do you guys do an intro as well? Uh, uh, yes. 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 Um, so I've done several videos at this point. I change it every every time, try to you know kind of keep myself fresh in that way. Um, and she's got two that she rotates between, right? So, but we do. I think that's important. I think it's helpful to have something up there initially that they can click on and see. Um, and some of what I've modeled in the videos, then they do sort of unconsciously in their own, and there's a much more engagement. Yeah. Um, so. One, in, one, in one semester, we followed up the intro activity with a synchronous session because it worked out for scheduling purposes on university life. So we had prepared questions. At this point, we moved them into smaller groups. We uh, have mixed groups. Each group got a set of questions, and then we brought them together in Skype to exchange answers and dialogue about right, those questions. And um, this was just a, the three, two, one, sort of the three takeaways, two burning, uh, or sorry, two action items and one burning question, right? Um, and so I com compiled all of this afterwards, right, when they just filled out these little slips of paper that I had prepared, essentially. Um, and so these were some of the things that they were surprised about or learned, right, in that, that conversation. Um, cost of books. Right, that they don't pay for books in Europe, right? Um, and that our students are paying four or five, six hundred dollars, depending on what they're taking. Um, the mascot, there's no mascot for the University of Oviedo, and yet, and you know, and there's the whole business of gun culture is very different too. So there's our mascot, the pioneer with the rifle, right? And and, and it's you know, and that's shocking to them, and so they talk about that. Um, so. Um, The collaborative work that we do in this particular coil is connected to uh, a translation activity. So my students are reading Hispanic literature, and we time it so that they move out of the Latin American portion of my class into, the, into Spain when the coil work starts. And the students in Spain are English studies students who are taking a translation course, an intro course, and They've been working on different kinds of translation, and when the, the coil starts, they're starting their narrative translations. Okay, so they've done other, you know, maybe like flyers, pamphlets, that kind of thing, and then they get to the narrative, and it's their first try. So they translate the opening, an opening paragraph of one of the books that we're reading. Okay, um, and then they produce the first draft of the translation. And it's, they send it to their small group partners in Glenville. 
So um, my students read the green is Glenville, and, or sorry, the blue is Glenville, the green is Oviedo. So my students read, their students are translating that um, first paragraph. Then they send it, and my students revise and comment. I do that in class. I leave time for that to happen in class because they often have questions about how to make some of these edits. Um, I don't expect my students necessarily to be perfect editors in that, in that regard. Um, they send it back. The Oviedo students can accept or reject those revisions, right? depending on how their group feels. They've handled the translation. And then we produce, I produce a chart of all of them. And the final step of this is, okay, as a group, then we're going to study this comparison chart. And we have uh, a Skype uh, to do that. So I think I have, yeah. Um, this is what that chart looks like. So here were some sections in this particular, every time it's a little bit different. Because, well, usually some of these are the same. But the original Spanish, how the different groups right, translated that. And then I also put in this category, which is the authorized translation that my students are reading. So the, the Oviedo students have the benefit of getting input from native speakers, which they find valuable. Um, they have the benefit of seeing how each of their groups is translated differently, and then they talk about why that happened, right? Um, but they also have the benefit of comparing this, uh, the group work, to the authorized version, and there's some interesting conversation usually about, well, we think our version's better, and here's why, right? Um, now, how does this help my students? Um, because at this point, when we get to this conversation, looking at this chart, they finish the novel. And they look at things that they say, well, okay, yeah, in terms of where Sir is placed or where, you know, we've got bad person, I'm not a bad person, I, Sir, am not a bad, I'm not, Sir, right? They say, well, it doesn't matter. It, so they're actually talking about syntax, and they're looking at syntax, and they're looking at diction, but they're doing it very organically, and they're saying, okay, well, what about, how does that connect to the character and your understanding of the character now? This first person narration. Does it matter when the sir gets put in there? And they say, well, yeah. And so they can get into sort of this um, deeper understanding and appreciation for the character and manipulation of language, right? How that's used to manipulate the reader um, by looking at these. Right, different um, versions. And for my students, this was actually really fascinating. I think because sometimes I forget, because um, they're coming at it from a different angle altogether. They were blown away that there were even different translations. How come it's in, in, in a very honest question from what, in the forum, right? How come they're not all the same? which was something that I wasn't necessarily expecting because I've kind of moved way past that, right? You're just not really thinking about that anymore. But, um, and that led to um, this, let's just see. This Skype conversation, I'll just play a portion of it where they were talking about um, at this point, sort of the role of the translator, the, you know, is a translator respected? And just the different, and what knowledge does a translator need, uh, maybe in addition to just being bilingual? So, so can we, can we uh, let Caroline jump in for a second? Uh, just like Michelle was uh, mentioning, that there needs, and as you were mentioning, there needs to be multiple translations. In our translation, um, assignment that when we work together that was my biggest concern is that the translation um, from Spanish to English wasn't going to uh, give the same inflection or meaning uh, to the, the original uh, Spanish language yeah. uh, however to interpret it in English I felt like those changes were necessary but I don't know if it would the right thing to do. Does that make sense? What do you say? <laughs> or anybody? Does it make sense, doesn't it? Uh, what I understand is that uh, in order to make the translation 
understandable, you have to change the, the original question somehow in order to make it more easier to, to understand the translation. That, was that your point? Yes, I think everyone was quite surprised when they saw the translation chart at all the different variants because, yeah. because we don't have a background in this class on translation and I think we kind of maybe thought that, okay, there'll be one version that appears. And so yeah. it was really fascinating for the group to discover, okay, every single group is slightly different and how does that work? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, so this was near you know, the end of the coil. We had an opportunity to get the, the whole group together. I used some of my class time. They came um, outside of class hours, right? So you know, because that's just how it worked out. Um, so they, there was, their, their group's a bit bigger. They weren't all there for that reason because this was um, well, late into the afternoon. And uh, we used Zoom to be able to record that so that I can keep some of this and use this footage in other, in other ways. Um, and that was actually a 45 minute uh, conversation when all was said and done. And they had a chance in the beginning to sort of just say, wave at their group members if they hadn't you know, done that um, sort of face to face yet. And, um, and we had prepared questions for them as we moved through the, the rest of the session. So it was a bit of socializing, a bit of academic work, and then actually my partner, because it was the end, she loves music, we have a lot of musicians, she's like, can we sing a song together? And I didn't get bring that clip because it didn't come out really well in the recording, but um, so they sang, right? They, you know, simultaneously, and it sounds kind of funny, but uh, it sort of provided a little bit of closure, right, for the whole, the whole unit. Um, So at about two different points along the way, I have, I have students um, do some reflection, right? And um, these are post-coil student reflections. This is a, an Oviedo student, and this is a Glenville student. Um, I couldn't, I mean, this is, like, this is so perfect and so on point that it's like, it, it seems like I paid her to, to write it this way, right? But that, that one is, is just really great. Um, and the Glenville student, though, is the one I want to sort of focus on for a minute because he said it actually caused me to focus more in the class. Right? Think, about, think about that. It caused me to focus more. Um, I'm not much of a reader, and actually, but I actually enjoyed reading this text as well as other texts. Okay? Uh, and this is, this is taken not from one of my students, from a history student um, in a different coil. Um, but you know, he's saying, I focused more, I read more, I was more engaged as a student because we were doing this. Okay? And I think I have a better understanding of the, the Spanish immigrant experience um, because of this, right? And <clears throat> so outcomes, moving kind of out from the sort of individual COIL model and thinking about where does this have a place in our institutions. Um, we, for the first time this fall, were able to include our own students, current students, and in this case, this is a, a Nahuac in Mexico. We have a relationship with them institutionally, right? So a Nahuac uh, instructor student Glenville faculty, Glenville student who were, you know, remotely presenting at a conference in Chicago, hmm. okay, the Global Learning Conference. Um, and those, those are my colleagues, um, Art Mateo and Melody Wise. They've been sort of with me working on COIL pretty much from the get-go, and they're the most experienced faculty members in COIL at Glenville. Um, so, you know, I've had the opportunity to present several times at SUNY COIL, now at Global Learning Conference. It was great to have my colleagues with me at this conference. And then, it just for me personally, to see our students involved was, was another big, huge step forward for our, the program. What are some observations that I've made along the way? Um, I've, there's a lot, but I, I focused on a few here. Um, growth, right, in self-awareness. 
involves discovering several things. Okay. Um, so again, we were looking at how are they becoming more self-aware through this work, right? Um, and it could be because if you go back, you think back to the pre-test, right? Well, what's the post-test? If you're, if you're all kind of already thinking, what are the post-test results? They're mixed. 50% um, are moving along that scale and 50% are, right? So it's not perfect yet. Um, but within the 50% the that are moving, it's also kind of mixed. Some are moving up and some are moving down. And you think, well, is that, that indicates regression. Okay. But in intercultural education, if you're looking at assessment of intercultural education, what a lot of people are pointing out is that um, that regression, when you look at other direct measures of assessment, right, is misleading. So, the idea that maybe what I thought about, what I thought to be true about X is actually wrong. So students who go in placing, you know, at a four or a five, and then they realize, oh, I didn't really know that much, and I'm actually not as in tuned as I thought I was, and they end up placing at a four or a three. A more accurate, maybe, reflection of who they are as intercultural, right, individuals. Instead of regression, it's more of the development of Exactly, exactly, but that could that could lead if you're just looking at the data and this backward movement that then your administrators say, well, what's going on? They're not right. They're not moving forward. Um, so all of this has to be sort of contextualized. Um, or I thought I knew a lot about X, but I realize now that I don't. Right? Uh, I had a student say, I thought everyone in Spain was rich and drove BMWs. Honest to God, <laughs> right? And it's you know so right. Um, <coughs> some combination of A and B. Learning gold <laughs> um, The other big thing, moving beyond surface comparisons, the four Fs, um, food, folklore, um, festivals. festivals. What's my last one? That was gonna festivals. Be family. Family, probably. Fashion. Yeah. Often, it often requires nudging. Okay, so how do you get them past the Oh yeah, well once I tried a paella, right? Or once I tried this, I don't know, a pepperoni roll, right? Um, how do you get them past that? You, it, you have to be very deliberate, and you have to sort of design your activities in such a way that they're going to move beyond that initial right exchange into something that's more, um, well, less superficial, right? The comfort level with communication and tech tools varies widely, but. It's generally true that most students are quite needy when it comes to video conferencing skills, etiquette, and troubleshooting. So we think of them as this tech savvy generation, and they are, and I'm sure you're already aware of this. You use Sakai, I believe, right? Um, with the number of problems you probably have with them just managing Sakai, right? I don't know if that's an issue, we have that issue. Constantly trying to work with our students to get them to use Blackboard well. Um, so, they're not familiar really with Blackboard or Sakai or Moodle. And then you're asking them to use something else like Zoom, right, so that they can record small group sessions or that they could record their own video. Because if they use their phone to record that video, that's when you get them sideways. You're like, uh, you know, that doesn't work. Or that's when they upload a playlist from their phone instead of the video that they're supposed to, right? And that, I mean, these are, these are things that have all happened, right? Um, or just the file sizes are too big, right? They're too big because their phones are so powerful these days, they're too big and they won't upload as I can't get it up. Um, so they need some help with, and that's why there's that time built in at the beginning to sort of get used to whatever platform that you may be using, whatever learning management system, and if you can, build some time in to train them. I actually ask them to come in, bring their laptops. We do a fake Zoom. We actually set it up. They do it with each other real quick so they know how to do it with their partners, right? Does it take away some of my class time? Yes. But it saves me hours of email and, and sort of running interference later. The other part of this, the video conferencing skills, they get nervous. They get really nervous. And I've had students sit live in a session and say, can I ask them uh, if they like this kind of, and I say, they're listening, and yes, why don't you ask them, right? 
or the guys sometimes if the guys you know they move closer to the camera right because sometimes we have to move them from where they are to get closer to the camera and this one kid I, he must have just been nervous he like saunters up rolls his sleeve up and just kind of like has his tattoo facing the camera and this really sort of aggressive stance and I'm what I was actually in Spain as this was happening right so I'm watching this you know, West Virginia, right, classroom, and my, and the student, I'm looking at the students in Spain, and they're all looking at each other like, who is this kid? What is happening, right? So, some prep work may be needed before they launch into these, right, live sessions, too. Um, the coil work makes classwork feel more practical, more relevant, and therefore more meaningful, okay? I do hear that a lot on both sides, not just the U.S. students. But when I was in Spain, interviewing the students in Spain, you know, especially those translation students, they say it became real, right? If, you know, I had I, I had to produce a text for a native speaker who was, you know, and 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 the input that I got, the things that I didn't think about beforehand, right, um, made the experience truly authentic in a way that otherwise, right, it might not have been. <clears throat> so. This is the, the book, there is a book, um, there's a developing field of sort of research, right, um, on globally networked teaching, COIO, virtual exchange. Um, but this came out in 2015, globally networked teaching in the humanities. And the first two chapters provide an overview of the, mod, of the, the model itself, what COIL is, how to implement it, and then the rest of the chapters are case studies. So just, you know, what happened in this coil between these two institutions? How did they make it work? What obstacles did they encounter? How did they problem solve, right? Um, so that's a good resource uh, to start with. And in terms of where does this look right now, what's the landscape in, in the state? Um, we have, we started in 2015 with two pilots at Glenville. We have uh, six or seven that run now at Glenville. We've got uh, a, one pilot that started in fall at West Lib, another in the works at West Liberty for this semester. We've got several people here on Shepherd engaged in COIL work and, and, and I think some pilots in the work for this semester too. So kind of look across the state, um, there are 12 COIL collaborations, hopefully, right, that all come to fruition for just this academic year at three now institutions instead of just one, right? Um, so it's a slow moving machine and it's not a perfect machine by any means. It depends a lot initially on just faculty initiative, right? And you know, you're not getting a paid extra for this. My, my faculty don't. Um, this, the, this faculty in Spain and Mexico don't, right? Um, but you know, I, I do keep, to the extent that the HEPC is involved, um, requesting funds, and, and the HEPC has been supportive, so they have put money towards uh, conferences. So my colleagues who went to the Global Learning Conference, that was paid for by HEPC. Um, a couple of years ago, a, a group of four or five of us um, from different institutions also went to New York to the SUNY conference and that was covered by HEPC. So there are some, there, there's that incentive, right, still that can maybe be worked in here. Um, but uh, for our students especially who, as you know, I think, probably, maybe it's a little different here, I don't know. Uh, we have a lot who just never even got as far as Morgantown. Mm -hmm. um, who've never left the state, who don't have a passport, have never been on a plane, right? Um, and so study abroad isn't necessarily for everybody and this is a way and actually what we're seeing happening now people who are coiling are losing some of that innovation are interested now in other international opportunities so we had a coiler who went to University of Oviedo and finished her career with study abroad there we have a coiler uh, one of, she coiled with Mexico. She's going to Panama this summer to do research for her biology uh, professor. So we're seeing actually some of our coil participants actually take another step 
with two this sort of traditional mobility, right? Um, and so for us, that's huge. Our study abroad numbers are less than 1% at Glenville. I don't know what yours are here. Um, you know, we're talking about maybe six to eight students a year max, right? So any, so any, any kind of influx that COIL can provide there is a benefit uh, for that program too. Um, questions, comments? Um, I've got my I've got cards I've got cards with me. I also you know my email is there, but um, you know it's kind of all over the place. The sort of broad right general picture, some more specific details. Um, but what can I can I clarify anything? Our next fossil's on Zoom, by the way, which we do have uh, campus licenses here. Hopefully people are aware by now and been trying to promote that, but um, so we're, we're fully set to do this with Sakai and Zoom. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that till last week. I'm so excited. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So ben Bankhurst uses it a lot. I, I just, um, I use it with my online class I'm doing right now. It's great. It's very easy. Um, but yeah, I just noticed Zoom. Zoom is next. <laughs> so. We just got ourselves the education um, plan too, so we have okay. 20 licenses yeah, that we 20. can use. Um, and you know, Sakai is great. Um, there should be some negotiating between you and your partner about which platform you use because uh, Oviedo uses Moodle, but their IT office is so much bigger and so much more responsive. They're just not overloaded in the way that ours is that it makes more sense for us to run it through Moodle. And it also is uh, an effort to sort of be very aware of the power balance, right, between institutions, between countries. So sort of saying, okay, your students don't speak English as a, as a native language. Let's not make them learn a whole other learning management system on top of this. Our students are native speakers. They don't have to ever worry about, well, their grammar's not perfect either, right? But they don't have to worry about that so much. So we'll make the adjustment and, and learn a different learning management system. But it doesn't have to be that either. There have been coils, there have been enough conferences now, so coils have happened completely outside of that space, like on Facebook, or with email, or uh, through something like WhatsApp, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit, it, that's where that everyone looks a little different, so it's hard to kind of have one answer that, that fits everybody's needs. Um, but you, you know, if you if you like Sakai and it's good, and your partner likes it, um, then you just need to kind of know, okay, what are the enro enrollment procedures for people outside of Shepherd, mm -hmm. right? In your IT office will um, be great, and you should actually include them in the design portion of modules. So we recommend that it be instructor, instructor, and if you have an instructional design person or someone from IT who can also be a part of that conversation. It'll help move things forward faster with fewer problems. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, thank you very much. Um, I was wondering, is there somewhere like a space where people meet, you know, to find one of those partners? I mean, how do you uh, go about that? Is there like a website, or do I say, "Hi, I need this mm -hmm. there"? <laughs> no, I just. I, it's a great question. Um, we haven't figured out a perfect way to do this yet. We, that we were talking at first about maybe putting up something on the ATPC site, um, or maybe having something on the Glenville site, just because that's where you know I am located. Um, the or creating some kind of listserv. Um, so we still are trying to figure out the best way to do that. In the meantime, um, I have a list of potential faculty from Spain and from Mexico and if you email me and get in touch with me you can see if we can't find a match so um, really I'm just a glorified matchmaker in, in this whole process right um, and because that's the hardest part too for a lot of a lot of people um, you could tap into your own international network if, mm -hmm. if there is one I would also suggest if, uh, do you have partner institutions abroad? Yeah. Okay. And I was going to say, um, Ava, I think that's one of the things that we should begin to do as we write these agreements with various um, 
countries is to begin to look at universities within those countries that we might be able to do yeah. things like. And, and I'm thinking particularly of the Ivory Coast. Um, we have several signed agreements with them. Um, some of the Northwest African countries, we already have those in place. So it might begin, and again, we would increase those relationships that we're already beginning to establish. Mm -hmm. So the relations is a really strange connection for us in some ways, and that came out of uh, you know her environmental science forest um, forestry mm -hmm. professor has a connection to the university there in Malaysia and and a colleague there, and so they discussed you know could we try this coil? He learned about coil for me. He bro he broached that with her. They tried a coil. They've since run two. Um, and now that's leading actually to conversations about other ways to collaborate with that university, right? Uh, but that came, you know, right through faculty members' own own network. So I hear you, and we're trying. I, I I'm trying to figure out the best way to put us all in touch. Um, but certainly, starting on campus with your own network is a place to at least get started too. Um, yes. Um, you mentioned that this, this is um, really geared towards students and student learning. However, could you see this leading to non-degree aspects? I, I, I run a lifelong learning program here, mm -hmm. and can you see that this could potentially come to fruition for other lifelong learning programs internationally? I think so. I think it's got a lot of potential um, outside of the sort of traditional classroom. You know, it could be uh, if there's service learning, if you have service learning projects, right? Um, how could you add an international component to those? Uh, connecting, right? So connecting groups that are doing the same kind of service in different countries and allowing them a chance to share those experiences or even design activities in, in, in common. Um, I, I think there are opportunities for this to be used for pre and post study abroad, right? Um, in terms of orientation, the standard orientation, right? The re-entry oriented, right? Um, how could COIL be leveraged and in, in work in conjunction with those programs? And where I really like to do more work, I don't have the time, is I'd like to see this extent on the secondary. You know, teacher education is a huge part of Glendale. That's who we are as sort of the backbone of our institution. We're, we're, and I'd love to have education, right? I'm trying to get more education classes involved in COIL so that at least they have some awareness and when they are placed in their schools or when they're um, actually teaching down the road, they might think about how they could use this method at the secondary level too. We're working with Berkeley County on the IRM. Mm -hmm. um, through the teacher training. Okay. Yeah. So I do see potential um, in a lot of different areas, and that's and act here's another one too. It need it, this was the the provost who he's no longer with us, but he wanted to use coil for the internationalization piece, but he immediately latched on to this should be domestic. This should be our rural kids engaging with urban students right around the US. And so at the last conference I was at, there was more discussion of how this could help just um, bridge some of the divide, right, internally in this in this country, right, with groups that don't typically interact, right? It, it need not be, right, outside of the US to still be uh, impactful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. If you have questions at any point, please feel free to contact me. If you want a card, I've got cards. And um, thank you again for taking time on your day. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you.